sharing for now. Yeah. Okay. Huh. I think uh, we have a fair number of people who have already right. joined. Yeah, we, can, uh, we can start for this. Okay, okay. Um, just one second. Yeah. So, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining this session. It's a great, uh, yeah, first of all, uh, really nice to start the academic side of the uh, program here with a lecture uh, by Professor L.S. Sasidhara. So it's a great pleasure to have Professor L.S. Sasidhara here with us today. Uh, he is currently a distinguished professor at Ahsoka University as well as Dean of Research there. He is also a professor at uh, Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Pune. He has been involved in so many things uh, related to institution building uh, and science uh, just generally contributed so much to the science ecosystem in the country. Uh, he, is, uh, he has numerous uh, awards and honors to his name. Uh, just to name a few, uh, it's a Santi Saru Bhatnakar Award, uh, National, J.C. Bose National Research Fellowship, he is a member of many, many uh, academies and national and international bodies of high prestige. He is uh, currently the president of Indian Union, uh, International uh, Union of Biological Sciences. And also he has been a vice president of Indian National Academy of Science. He is associate member of uh, the European uh, Molecular Biology Organization. He has taken part in uh, various uh, initiatives of the Indian government as well as in international bodies, including the United Nations. Uh, his uh, contribution has been immense, both as an academic, as well as uh, an institution builder. So he has done, contributed significantly, greatly to the ICER Pune, which, to which I, would, I was also had a pleasure of uh, studying there. And personally, it is a, it's a really great uh, honor for me to uh, have Professor Sasidhara here, because he was the one who introduced me to the world of science when I joined as an undergrad student at ICER Pune. So uh, it's, it's a really great pleasure and privilege to have you here, uh, Mr. Sasi. And he will be uh, today sharing with us a few thoughts related to um, science and technology, education and research in India, like the historical perspectives and the current structures that we have uh, currently in, in the country and how things are, what direction things are going and sharing some personal experiences from uh, that side. So. Uh, this is supposed to be a very interactive lecture, so uh, yeah, we will. Uh, we are really looking forward to uh, your your thoughts and uh, ideas from your side, Professor Sasi. So over to you with this very very brief introduction. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Suryesh. It was nice to be introduced by a student, a former student. Anyway, uh, you all can call me Shashi. You don't need to call me uh, Professor Shashi or anything. Uh, thanks to Professor Abhinandan for giving me this opportunity to talk to all the, the policy fellows. It's a very nice uh, to interacting with all of you. And feel free to stop me anytime uh, if you have a question. Uh, I may, um, so uh, is it okay if I go up to almost uh, go beyond a little bit four o'clock or you have to have a hard stop at four? No, actually, I mean, we decided to do it now because you said you had something later. So yeah, if you if the session goes beyond a little beyond four, that's perfectly fine. Okay, I mean it's up to them, depending on how much how many questions true, they true. ask. I'm sure okay. there will be so, lots of questions. I'm I'm my next okay. appointment is at four thirty, so that's what okay, I'm. Very doing. good. So then then okay. yeah, we are here. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, okay. what I'm going to do is mostly telling you stories, right? Uh, you know, anything when we talk about historical perspective, unless it's well documented, more recent. And it will become uh, connecting the dots with uh, less information between the dots, right? For example, if you take a graph sheet and you connecting, for example, height versus weight in a population, depending on what is your sample size, uh, the graph would look like a curved line, you know, or a, or a sort of straight line from one end to other end. But typically between two dots, you don't have any information. And the, when you draw a line between two dots, you just try to connect the two dots with the shortest path. That's because there is no other, you know, you can't make any assumption how it is going, whether, for example, going up and down kind of up, right? So the problem with the historical perspective is we'll have less information 
so we have to build stories right how from for example what happened in 18th century how do you connect to 19th century right so obviously there would be lots of missing information you somehow connect the dots right that's what the story is about whereas you are all science policy students or scholars you are supposed to build your policy uh, you know or frame your policy which is supposed to be evidence based then you collect the data you analyze the data generate evidence and then you try to design or frame the policies but if your data is incomplete doesn't mean that you cannot even think of policy it may not be ideal but still you have to do because we need some policies for everything that we want to do in this modern world right it's not like a a, a small town of 2000 people whatever the decision you take right you can take by talking to everybody it is so small a town you don't need a you know a, a much uh, you know uh, data to be collected analyzed prediction what may happen what may not happen who may respond how for different policy uh, you know uh, implementation because unless people implement with letter and spirit how do you expect the policy to provide the right benefit right for example nep 2020 you know it's one of the best documents i have read it recently uh, thankfully it's only 66 pages when they first released it was 1600 pages and um, and i was also contributing to one or two chapters but now the 66 pages is really really nicely written it sort of outlines the mission vision for the country for the next let's say 30 40 years but it's not it's a country of 1.5 billion people we have millions of teachers tens of millions of students how do you implement a policy something like nep 2020 in a country of our size and scale and complexity and if we don't implement well obviously we will not get the right benefit right of what the policy was intended to be so that's why your policy when you frame for a country of our size has to be extremely evidence based based on the large amount of data it cannot be based on the superficial data it cannot be based on some one perspective collect the data from one perspective for example how do teachers perceive education but that's not enough you also need to understand how students perceive education how parents of the students perceive education how the in the past whatever the policy that was framed and you know when it was implemented whether the policy to implementation to final outcome is there a straight line or there is a deviation if there is a deviation what was the reason or the deviation turn out to be an unintended benefit rather than unintended uh, cost to the society so you can look at from variety of different ways and and uh, you know each one of us do a small bit uh, to a large policy uh, framework right so you may be collecting data some may be collect doing analysis some may be writing few chapters but bigger picture you have to have a you know in your mind irrespective of how much you contribute because it's like a big puzzle right and and you may be for doing one module of the puzzle but if you don't have a bigger picture about what is this all about right your efficiency of solving that small module uh, will also be less effective right uh, and that's one of the reasons why you need to have a the bigger picture however a smaller bit that you are contributing when you contribute in smaller bit you go deeper and deeper because you collect more data you start analyzing for example you know uh, bat technology for agriculture or or biomedical devices or uh, how to improve the supply chain uh, pipeline for diagnostic kits considering there is a pandemic we need more diagnostic kits to handle our rtpcr requirement or how to sort of size you know make sure that the public health you know infrastructure for vaccination is very effective and not only vaccination of of 1 point plus 1, 1 billion people over the next one year remaining children of half a billion of them how when to vaccinate them how to vaccinate them and there will be continuously new born children how to vaccinate them you know you need to you know have a uh, a lot of work has to get into this and you may go deeper and deeper and you may forget what am i doing why i am doing all of these things 
So if you don't always connect it to the bigger picture. So that's history. What history provides you is that bigger picture, right? Today, for example, you look at India, you know, all kinds of chaotic situations. There are some success stories. There are lots of failures. You know, people are suffering. There is inequality. But at the same time, you look from a person, you know, from a perspective, historical perspective about how India has progressed for the last 50 years. You will see that some pockets have done extremely well. Some pockets have not done well. Some have actually suffered a lot. Some have gained a lot. In inequality to some extent is reduced. In some context, inequality is in, you know, increased. Standard of living, how it is changed. So you, you can get a bigger picture about you know, what has happened in the last 50 years. Then you can ask the question, what made this change happen? Then you can say, what is the role of site technology in all of these things? And did the people in 1950s were thinking of all of these benefits when they actually introduced a policy? Right? For example, green revolution. So the people who executed or the a policy for green revolution, right? did they have enough data to start with? Did they think of the benefits? Did they think of the cost of that benefit? What would happen to the soil? What will happen to the water usage pattern? What will happen to the, the pollution? And what may happen to the healthcare system if you, you know, indiscriminately use fertilizers and uh, pesticides? How to implement a policy of uh, modern agriculture in a country where you know, more than 50% of the farmers are illiterate? Have they, did they think about all these issues when they're framing the policy? So this is why you need to get a historical perspective, which will help you to think better for us for today's time, because that's important, because the past will help you to frame policy for the future, because you will understand the successes and failures, what works, what won't work. You know, society has changed definitely in the last 30, 40 years, but it does not change to that extent that our mindset is so much different. It's still, we are all, you know, Indians have a particular type of cultural background, certain kinds of uh, noise in the society, certain kinds of uh, lethargy and inefficiency, and in some cases is extremely active and uh, driving force. And there is a lot of influence from the Western countries in the last 30, 40 years because of the global communication and the global reach. To what extent it has penetrated in our culture, to what extent we can use the Western style of policy framing and implementation to Indian system. Uh, are we in a, in a way, in a very sort of a two-phase system? In one phase, we are more Western, in another phase, more Indians. So, you know, how do you deal with policy for an Indian situation, right? So, you know, there are so many interesting questions you can ask, irrespective of which area of science and technology innovation policy you are going to work for. Okay, okay so, uh, you know, Suresh, I need a few camera to be on. I'm feeling that I'm not speaking to anybody. I'm just speaking to myself. Sure, sure. Uh, I, 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 I always, in my class also, whenever I give, I, te I teach, Make sure that at least some five, six cameras are on. Okay. I request yeah. some of the fellows to also turn on their camera if they are in uh, if they are in situation to do that. Yeah, uh, I mean, I don't mind if they do. You know, yeah. you get bored, and if they have to close their eyes, is fine. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice. Okay. So um, perhaps you can start uh, sharing my screen now. So. Sure. Sure. Uh, is everyone able to see it? Yeah. I have to go to the present mode. Yeah. Today she went away. Went away. Uh, think. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Okay. Uh, one second. I'll try to share again. Maybe when you went for the slide mode, maybe. It's yeah. Set the. Yes, now it is visible. Make it full screen and we are we are. Yeah. Yes, I forgot how to do that. Yes, yeah, that's this one. one. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so uh, I have sort of given uh, some kind of introduction of what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to really start from a very early period 
and you know, sorry, um, you know, if it is too sort of basic and fundamental, Devi, I thought it's very important when we talk about history, we don't know where to start. Should we start with 1947 or should we start with 1857? Or should we start with, uh, you know, <clears throat> 180 or 250 AD? You know, we, we see, we don't know, right? So let me start as early as, as possible. And being a biologist, being an evolutionary biologist, let me start with, uh, with evolution of human species. Okay, Suresh, next slide, please. Oh, no, of course, don't worry, I mean, it's not a biology lecture. So uh, the human evolution, as we uh, know now, based on the evidence, it's uh, over the last five million years, we sort of branched out from a common uh, great ape as an ancestor. One branch gave rise to uh, chimpanzees and uh, other branches, modern humans. Amongst the human species, there were several, several human species. They evolved, became extinct. The only one survived. And that's the Homo sapiens sapiens that we are, the so-called modern humans, right? But this happened over over five million years, and as you can see in the next slide, uh, as you can see here, as also in the next slide. Uh, uh, okay, I think we can skip this. We'll go to the next one. Oh, okay. So uh, maybe go back. Yeah. Sorry. So Homo Homo sapiens uh, evolved uh, in uh, Eastern Africa. And all human species, uh, most human species, not all, uh, usually evolved in uh, Eastern Africa, uh, particularly, definitely the modern Homo sapiens, there is sufficient fossil evidence. And uh, less than 200,000 years ago, and uh, they started uh, spreading out of Africa uh, over the last 100,000 years. Okay? And they started in all directions, you know, some unidirection, sometime in different directions. And next slide, please. Right, and sort of they started spreading across the world. This is just one route they took out of Africa to, you know, via the Central Asia, from Central Asia towards, you know, Russia, Russia to, or say, you know, uh, sorry, Western Asia, Western Asia to Central Asia, and then Southeast Asia and to other places, all the way up to Australia, New Zealand, and so forth. This is one particular route. There are multiple routes coming from out of Africa, but the year, the time that has taken is about 100,000 years, it's not too, you know, longer time period for human uh, generations concerned. So it's, we are not evolved into different groups and there is always a continuous mixing. And because of which we are still as one species, although we have spread across the world over the last 80,000 years. Next slide, please. Right. And this is what I'm trying to say. Even if we are spreading, we are also sort of mixing with each other in different pockets. So in a way, it's a continuous population. It is not an isolated population. So it's still only one human species. Okay, this has repeated in the history several times. If you go to the next slide. So in fact, not only different human groups in different parts of the world were continuously mixing there because of the spreading and super spread, you know, one spread and settled in one place. Another migration wave of migration happened. New set of people came, but they were mixing rather than you know separately living all the time so in fact to an extent that even the four different species of human distinct anatomically distinct species existed around the same time both in time and space as early as as recently as 30000 years ago right for example if you look at this uh, timeline neanderthalensis and uh, sapiens were at the same time in the same space just as recently as 30,000 years ago. It's indeed, we know in the next slide, uh, they did, uh, uh, sorry, I, maybe some order is missing. Uh, so they did mix, I'll come to that in a minute. So there is genetic evidence or genomic evidence to say that they intermated. And so we are basically one big continuous human population. And there are no major differences between whether an African or a Japanese or a Chinese or Indian or a Western population. Culturally, we are different. Cultural evolution happens at a much faster rate. Biological evolution is much slower. And the time taken for biological evolution in the last 100,000 years and the fact that we are continuously mixing has made that human species is one common group. There are no even races. Earlier, people used to think that there are races, like, you know, American is one race, the Indian, Red Indians are one race, Chinese and Japanese are one race or uh, African race. Even that is also not true. 
it may have it has actually is true in generally in biological evolution among the primates among the insects among the plants even a smaller time scale they actually can get separated so much humans are very distinct that way because of our ability to move around ability to adapt to various different environmental conditions without having biological components because of the artificial way of adapting to high temperature or low temperature or low humidity or high humidity this ability to adapt to a changing uh, extreme conditions has enabled us to mix all the time rather than living separately in a specific geoclimatic conditions and that what makes you know the organisms to evolve differently or they become initially different races and ultimately may become different species humans are the only species known amongst the mammals amongst the primates where even after they separated for 100000 years or so from a common ancestral space like eastern africa there is still continuous mixing that's one of the reasons we can never build, if we can't consider human you know populations are different in terms of races or subspecies we are all one common group with a continuous genetic flow what we call next slide please <clears throat> so we are indians uh, india has a loss you know huge this fertile and hospitable land basically the great indo gangetic plain and if you look at on the west on the north all the way up on the west also there's himalayan range there is a small pass here and there khyber pass right and on the east again very thick uh, forest that uh, northeast forest and also himalayan range and then the other three sides sea so what happens is it basically i gets isolated the people can come in right but it is not an open route you somehow you manage and come in and then you sort of get sort of trapped in this kind of a land mass well multiple migration happen people came in different waves in different time points over the last you know 30 40000 years ago homo sapiens right but they all came and sort of mixed and there was of course you know there is nothing like directed migration right of those are the days when you simply look out for more resources and it, that's why it's called spreading you don't call it as migration migration has a targeted movement whereas spreading has no targeted movement people spread but the indo gangetic plain and the further south became a natural habitat for people to settle while the new waves of you know people came from outside india they sort of mixed with the existing people so india became a great melting pot for genetics and cultural mixing right and that's the great india's you know unique feature or usp what you can call next slide please just this is just to show this was supposed to be the one slide before so for example uh, neanderthals and denisovans uh, genomic evidence is there in our uh, genome too that means there was been a mixing of multiple species denisovan is a new species which was discovered only about 2 3 3 or 4 years ago um a uh, new species first discovered in siberia in russia and wherever for example if you look at black spot means there is less mixing for example if you look at the bot top black spots are only in africa that means there is less mixing of neanderthals and homo sapiens in africa whereas out of africa almost every part of the world has mixing of two different species if you go down to denisovans Denisovan is a new species. It's not so much spread. It's not very different from Homo sapiens, although it is called new species, but it is not scientifically declared as new species. It could be simply a separate group. But India and uh, you know China and other places where Denisovans and Homo sapiens have totally mixed, whereas Europe and Africa you don't see so much of mixing. As you can see, there's only black spots. Okay, next slide, please. And here, this is what we India. over the last 30000 years also the continuous spreading now actually the evidence is about 60000 years of spreading of homo sapiens there are other homo human species existed in india uh, which they have become extinct like any other place amongst the the groups which spread out of africa modern homo sapiens we have been receiving 
um, you know, people coming in to the Indus Peninsula, Indian Peninsula for the last, uh, you know, 60,000 years. But major, major, major population spread happened only in the last 30,000 years, although there is some archaeological evidence for 60,000 years of settlement. So India is a great melting pot as this one. But right now we have 4,635 well-defined uh, populations. Many of them are tribes, some of them are primitive tribes, a huge language diversity, you know, clothing diversity, cultural food diversity, marriage practices, and 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 where and so many things. And geo adaptation to geoclimatic conditions, the disease prevalence and and or resistance to infectious diseases or susceptibility. There's a huge diversity. Okay, next slide, please. Now, the reason I want to spend a little bit of time on this, which is very important for the policy. To understand your policy, you need to know why human societies are so complex, why you cannot communicate so easily, why you cannot implement a good policy, however good the policy is in a society like human society, particularly in a society like ours. Right? First thing is, what is that different in human species compared to all other animals? There are multiple differences you can think of. But what is the key difference which made us different from rest of the animals is the language. That is the syntactic language use. Of course, language is there in many, many uh, other organisms too. And plants communicate with each other with the help of a chemical language. And uh, animals communicate with the help of, you know, the body language as well as the sound language. Because they can see, they can see what's happening with the other, you know, partner in the group or they can also hear. You know. So there are different ways of communicating. They also use uh, chemical smell, other language. For example, the insects, the male and female attraction is based on the pheromones and this pheromone is a hormone and they smell the pheromone and, and, and see that there is a female here. A male would smell the presence of a female. It happens in large animals too, like tigers. They also use pheromones to detect a presence of opposite sex from a, from a longer distance, right? But that's the one type of language. But the ever ability of language is not only sound based language, but we can use, first of all, our vocalization is more diverse than any animal that you can think of. The sound box has evolved in such a way that we can actually produce, you know, almost unlimited number of syllables. The second is um, developing a syntactic language. There is an evidence that syntactic language at a very primitive level, it's present even among some birds and some primates, but it is not elaborated the way we have elaborated the syntactic language and which has helped us to communicate as you know in an almost unlimited way. Right. So if you take three words, you can put these three words in three, see three different ways and they get three different meanings. Right. So you can use a smaller number of uh, even a smaller number, your vocabulary even is small, but you can still generate more communication because of the syntactic language. Next slide, please. So uh, there are a lot of impact of higher you know, language, including the theory of mind and our ability to communicate and reason, and even uh, something which you imagine you can communicate, something you have experienced you can communicate. Advantage of all of these things is in the next slide. Is we are not anywhere dependent on our own personal experience to understand the world. What language has done is I can understand the world with the help of someone else's experience. So Galileo saw something and interpreted in a particular way and then he discovered something and then we are all following that as one of the major laws of physics, right? Or, you know, whether it is the heliocentric world or a solar system or the, um, uh, you know, atomic world or germ theory in biology, you know, very different scientists have discovered something. They have explained 99.999% of the population do not even experience or understand. They can visualize any of these things, but we are happily follow this. There is a coronavirus and this coronavirus is causing the COVID-19 disease and we have to wear masks, uh, wash our hands. Some scientists have discovered, they have communicated to us and and we don't need to follow and understand and personally experience with the help of our own sensory organs. We can actually dependent only on the language to understand the natural world. So that expands our understanding of the world much more than 
what our other animals can do because they are still dependent on their own personal sensory organs, right? Their ability to communicate something which has happened one day before to another animal is almost non-existent. There is no clear experimental evidence in any way for an animal to communicate what it has seen one day before. Honeybees can actually, with the help of memory, can communicate nectar in the morning what they have seen, but their memory is very short. But we can communicate 50 year old story to you, you know, based on our you know, ability to communicate. We can write down and, and communicate to the next 100 years, 200 years you know, of the people. Today we are reading books written by someone who 2000 years ago, right? Or Shakespeare 500 years ago, or, uh, you know, uh, some Sanskrit scholars of the, you know, uh, early beginning of the, you know, calendar year uh, AD. Right. So as you can make out, our ability to integrate knowledge is far better than anybody else, any other organism ever lived on this earth. Although we are here only for the last 30, 40,000 years and the life is on earth is 3.5 billion year old. Right. But we, yeah, human species, the only one which can integrate knowledge horizontally as well as vertically. And this ability to integrate knowledge has actually exploded our cultural evolution explode our ability to innovate, explode our ability to plan things ahead of time, which is what policy is all about. Plan things ahead of time, right? Is that's what policy is all about. Next slide, please. So uh, coming directly to the topic of uh, today's discussion, we all talk about learning, we all talk about education, right? There is something actually different. Learning, the next slide, please. Yeah, so the learning is typically by imitation. You actually have to see things being done. We also have to learn many times. For example, you cannot learn car driving simply by reading a book. You want to see someone driving the car, right? And then, then you also practice. So there are certain types of things you need to learn by actually seeing things happening, right? That's why it's very important that, you know, science has to be taught in the laboratory because unless students learn how things are done, how things are built, they'll not be able to learn better, right? So learning is very important to some extent, which cannot be only with the help of a book, right? Some of them takes ages, you can still learn, right? You can learn how to build, like for example, uh, you know, uh, 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 how to assemble, a, let's say a table, right? How, how to make a table, a carpenter have, may have written a book, let's say. You may take years to learn and you know develop that skill if you don't have another human being to explain to you if you only know the language in which the book is written the second one is the learning through formal education this is specific to only human civilization the learn learning by imitation by you know some way of explaining to other animals it's there in other animal groups too whereas learning with the formal kind of an education system, learning how to learn. We teach, what we teach actually in schools and colleges in anywhere in the world is supposed to be learning how to learn. It is actually learning, not the content that's important. You may teach physics as a content, chemistry or mathematics as content, but actually what you're teaching is how to learn physics, how to learn chemistry, how to learn phys mathematics with the help of specific examples in that particular discipline. And that's formal education is you know, specific to human, even among the human, the next slide, please. It's, um, okay, I think we can skip this one, go to the next slide. It's interestingly, it was not known until very recently in most part of the world. Assuming that the modern human civilization started about 15,000 years ago in Central Asia when the agriculture started, or a little bit more, when the wheel was invented about 6,000 years ago, or a little bit more when script was invented about 5,000 years ago. But still, the so-called modern, sorry, formal education system was limited to certain civilizations, particularly in India and, uh, you know, uh, surrounding countries, what we call as surrounding country. In those days, there is nothing like different countries. It is simply this Southeast Asian region right, or Indian Peninsula, you can call, is the place where education was more formal. In most other parts of the world, that 
there was really no education. There was nothing like schools and colleges or anything. People will just learn the language as part of the family learning, and they'll learn how to hunt or gather food or even agriculture by, by imitation, right? And uh, go to the next slide. Okay, now fast tracking. So I'll not get into the Indian history of 2000 years because again, we had formal education, we had a lot of knowledge production, number system to, you know, very different philosophical understanding of the world and so forth. But still, there was nothing like a policy, right? To, for the whole country, for the whole state, there was nothing like a country in those days. For example, you know, the, the, some of the best work in mathematics and physics and astronomy was done in 8th and 9th century in, in current Kerala, right? So some of the scholars, Sanskrit scholars of the current Kerala state are the ones who wrote some fantastic books on mathematics and uh, astronomy. But there was nothing like a policy saying that, oh, we should teach mathematics to a large population in a Kerala state or a astronomy to a large population in Kerala state. Right? Or they didn't think that, okay, if I spread this knowledge, people will bear in, do good business, or good agriculture, or build buildings better because they have better mathematics uh, or geometry understanding, or they will, you know, build roads better. You know, there was no such policy kind of a thinking, right? You know, some group were inter interested in certain intellectual activity and they contributed. But large population was going in an auto mode to grow and some improvisation is to happen, which is not by planning, simply because of some experience. Oh, last five years, there was no rain, but this crop grew well and this crop didn't grow well. So whenever there is less rain, I would grow this crop A, which grows less, which grows better in the dry conditions than the crop B. So that you improvise in the agriculture, right? But that's one type. Sometime in 17, 16th, 17th century, British came, they started spreading across the country and Britain was ruled by British and where they what they're ruling is several you know hundreds of kilometers away from you know from the current where the Britain is right and so there's a huge distance so whatever you take a decision if if the if the parliament of Britain takes a decision to communicate to the Britishers ruling India it would take two months and then they have to implement. What is the impact of that implementation? Again, it takes one year to return back to the, you know, London and say that, you know, this is what you told us to do. We did. This is what happened. And if they had to do something different, then again, they had a huge communication time that day. Second is, India is a large country, geographically very large country. Population, we don't know, uh, I don't know rather. I think estimated population in 18, uh, beginning of 19th century is I think 200 million if I'm correct, right? And at the time of uh, our independence, I think we are about 500 to 600 million. Yeah, maybe about 200 million at that time. 200 million is still a very large population considering that the entire Britain was, you know, less than 10 million, right? So if a small group of people, let's say a few thousand Britishers in Britain, trying to rule a country which is so large, with so many people, with so many different languages, right? How do you do this effectively? Then the first time, it's actually first time in the world, a formal policy kind of a framework was initiated for looking at what we need to do in the next 15, 20 years kind of a thing. British, Dutch, Spanish, they all had small, small policy framework. If you do this, 10 years later, we may earn more money or 10 years later, we may spread to another colony. There was some kind of a, you know, decisions, but that were not evidence-based policy. There was no study. What Macaulay did was to collect as much information about India as possible. Uh, he may have interpreted in, a, in his own, you know, racist way uh, because he's a, he's, a, he's a British and trying to rule India. But he actually did of what you people are trying to do here, collect data, analyze the data, and, and come out with a policy for a targeted, you know, purpose. The purpose here for Macaulay is very clear. British should rule India, it should rule effectively and perpetually, right? There should not be any, you know, rebellion. 
there should not be any mutiny. And there are India also still had so many small, small provinces. Those rulers of those provinces should, you know, would, you know, uh, pay obeisance, or what is called, or, 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 uh, basically some taxes to the British government, right? So, but we need large number of people to rule the country and we cannot send so many thousands of people from Britain. So that's where he thought of a new education system for India. And as you can see here, although, you know, you may dislike the language he used, but these are historical fact. We have to use it. We have to read it for the purpose for which you went read. He said, we must at present do our best to form a class who may be interpreters. You can see here what he wanted as Indian clerks, right? Between us, that is British, and the millions whom we govern, they are Indians. And who are we are governing? They are different class of people. They are, you know, variety of different languages they speak. They're kind of different food habit and everything. But we want to homogenize them. The interpreters should be our, in, you know, maybe Indian in blood and color, but they should be English in taste, in opinions, in morals and intellect. As you can see here, he was also trying to say that British are morally and intellectually superior than India's, right? And to that class, we may leave it to refine the vernacular dialects of the country, to enrich those dialects with terms of science borrowed from the Western nomenclature and to random them by degrees, fit vehicles for conveying knowledge to the great mass of population. Okay, I mean, don't worry about the details. So what basically thing is, here is a policy and how to implement this policy across a country such as big as India. So he said, let's first start with interpreters, intermediaries, or what called the great Indian clerks, who will sort of liaise between the rulers who are the British officers and the local people. The next slide. So that is where so-called modern education started in India. I call it as first wave. By the way, uh, I, I don't know how many of you heard about uh, Professor Rodham Nasima, who recently passed away. Uh, you know, he was a great scholar, historian of science and so forth. In fact, when I use the word first, second and third wave, they are actually, you know, used by, at least as far as I know, it was first used by Professor Rodham Nasima uh, in his uh, narrative of modern education, science education particularly. Okay, so the first way we call it, call it as British initiative because they initiated this modern education system. They wanted Indians to be part of the administration. They were not talking about Indians to become another Shakespeare, Indians to become another Newton or anything, right? They were looking for Indians to become, you know, clerks in the administration. So they need to certain learn. First thing is they need to learn the English language. The best way to learn English language is to learn through literature. So you teach them Shakespeare, Wordsworth, you know, uh, Dickens and all those people. Then you teach them philosophy because you talk about ethics, morality and everything, human rights and everything. It's, it's part of the British, you know, system because British moved away from monarchy to do democratic uh, parliament based ruling system as early as in, uh, in the beginning of 17th century. So they wanted to teach philosophy from that context. And then science, because the much of the British's superiority in, in the in the current at that time and the previous hundred years and the next hundred years from from eighteenth uh, century to twentieth century is because of the science, right? So then, basically, the second one, which is not mentioned here, is the most important thing they also taught was law. In a way, philosophy and law is combined, right? Ethics, morality, and the rights are all combined as part of the British law system legal system. In fact, most of the student of Indians who studied in British system either became clerks or they became lawyers. Or some of them became philosophers, you know, uh, uh, and and uh, literary figures, reformists like Raja Ramon Rai and so forth, right? Okay, next slide, please. So the, in the first wave, they started, you know, Many things. Presidency College in the first one started in 1817, which completed 200 years recently, was started in that time. And then they started Presidency College in Madras, then University in Kolkata, Bombay, in Madras, and University of Allahabad, and so forth. This is what you call as first wave of modern education. They started these schools and colleges and universities. Next slide. 
Okay. Now, this is something you need to learn from the history. You all spend a lot of time in collecting the evidence and frame a policy. You also develop an implementation strategy. Then what happens? Will you get intended benefit, you know, results or not? The outcome is intended or not? Sometimes it can be completely unexpected. For example, some of the original five-year plans post-independence didn't go well it's simply because we had war with Pakistan, right? 1950s, there was a war, 1960s, there was a war and kind of thing. So some fire plan went, you know, go wrong because of the war, the Chinese war and so forth. Some didn't go well because of famine, right? Only post-green revolution, the fire plan, the planning to execution to outcome, right? There is some linear relationship, not as desirable, but still reasonably okay. You know, outcome, right? And anyway, so look at what happened with with Macaulay's. What Macaulay wanted was obedient Indians working for British government, but learn English language, learn English law, learn English science, but they work for Britain. But that didn't happen because that precisely the purpose of education is to open up your mind, make you think, start thinking. The formal education makes you start thinking, right? Unlike simply teaching how to do things, that skill transfer, traditional way of you know learning things from parents to grandparents and all, you try to imitate, right? But you don't. You may improvise based on some experience, but you don't critically think, critically evaluate, and try to come out with some new insights or completely negate the what is known and think of something new, right? Something like what science does. You throw out all the, for example, Galileo could not have, you know, seen what he saw, which actually he didn't see anyway. He didn't see that it is the earth which is moving around the sun. He interpreted as earth which moves around the sun, right? But Galileo didn't inherit blindly the previous knowledge. He challenged it and used the scientific methods and came out. That happens only if there's a formal education system like this at a large scale. Of course, you may get one or two blips here and there, you know, one Archimedes here, one Aristotle, one Galileo or Newton, but formal education makes them to come out with larger number. Macaulay's formal education made Indians to see the hypocrisy that they're talking about human rights, they're talking about democracy, they're talking about rule of people. And what they're doing here is completely opposite to uh, what they are actually preaching, right? The English legal system based on the philosophy of equality is not being implemented in India. English, the administrative system, which is built on the on 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 universal uh, uh, benefit, it is not being implemented in India in the same way. This and at the same time, they also saw some of the good things about the human rights male and female equality. There is no differences between, you know, certain kind based on the, you know, caste or class. So those things also they saw, right? So, so what actually read two things in the next slide. One is Indians, the awareness of so-called Indian nationalism, right? It, yeah, next slide. So the so-called Indian rationalism arose because of the education system. We didn't know, we don't know, for example, if Macaulay had not come out with an interesting, this policy that he wanted, perhaps it was got delayed, this whole transformation. So in the nationalism, there are two kinds of things. There's the political rebellion against, you know, Britain. There was also a reformist in terms of education, cultural changes, as well as the use of science and technology for, you know, for Indian benefit. For example, Mysore province, there's a famous engineer, Visheshwaraya, tried many, many things using the British science and technology, but for the benefit of Indians. First time he started a hydroelectric power station in India. Many things he did for the first time in India. He built dams in multiple different parts of the country, right? And we started science in Calcutta, for example, you know, cultivation of science is as old as 1876, which where Raman did his Nobel winning work. J.C. Bose started his work in Calcutta around the same time. And 
large number of reformists, even much earlier than this time, Raja Ramon Roy and others, Mahatma Pule in Pune, Savitri Bhai Pule for women education, and uh, you know, and of course Gokhale and the other reformists of the society want to think differently because we are all monarchy and feudal system. They wanted to come out of the feudal system. They also wanted to come out of the caste system, like Ambedkar much later, of course. Pule much is earlier to try to remove the caste system. So these reformists are also part of the same education system. And also people who became politically, you know, rebelling against uh, British are also from the same education system. And then, of course, they started their own education system so that it's better if we run our own education system for Indians rather than use mix of both best of India and best of Western philosophy and provide the good education rather than simply dependent on uh, uh, Western system of education by the Western people directly. So they wanted to start a new education system. That's what you can call second wave, which is still British India, but the education system started by non-colonialists, non-imperialists, like Indian Institute of Science Bangalore, where Professor Abhinandan is a professor and Suresh is working now, and I think many, some of you may be there in, uh, sitting there in IAC Bangalore, or BHU, in another great institution of India. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Okay, that's skipping. There's just the more data. Okay, so let's fast track. 1847, we became independent, and uh, you know, India wanted to sort of invest on in science and technology. One of the two reasons is some of the scholars of that time, whether political uh, leaders or otherwise, you know, they were basically were seeing that there is a lot of sense in following science not only because science provides better technology and and ease you know reduces poverty and uh, you know suffering they also thought that our way of thinking itself will change you know we come out of superstitions we come out of other you know uh, dreading customs and traditions right and we will become scientifically more literate becomes then become more rational in the society reduces the conflict right so what is called scientific temper so that's why they also gave more importance to um, uh, science education. Uh, that's where, you know, led by that first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, in this uh, mode of thinking. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, you're all science policy, uh, you know, scholars. So I don't need to explain to you what science is. You know, it's, it uses qualitative and quantitative methods. It reduces the bias. It's not supposed to be unbiased. Our absolute science is absolute unbiasedness, which may take us towards the absolute truth. We may never reach, but you still at least a path towards absolute truth to understanding whether the natural world or the social world. Next slide, please. Next slide. I don't know why this slide. I think I must have not deleted some slides. I just want to use this. One of the main, that's why, why you need data, why you need evidence. And, and uh, to generate uh, even a policy document. Why can't you think of a policy out of your perception? There is anyway, we see a poverty, for example, right? So we see poverty, eight, if we 80, 800 million people or 80 crore people are still dependent on ration, right? They call it ration card and get food and uh, oil from a ration shop. Remaining 60 crore people are not dependent on ration. They have a, a kind of afford and go and buy. Now, if you want to reduce this dependent on ration card, if you want to sort of make, you know, bring the two groups together, reduce the inequality, what should be our policy? What kind of a science we need to do? Now, unless you have a sufficiently unbiased data, right, you will never be able to frame a good policy because your policy and based on perception can be highly biased, right? And even if let's say, oh, my job is, you know, I know I may be biased, but I'll have consult 100 people. I'll do a survey, I'll consult 100 people and take the, the majority opinion. That I, I likely to be unbiased. Let's say if 90, per, 90 people out of 100 say, you know, let's do this, that will reduce the poverty. Is that the right thing to do? As a science student, you should never only believe in what others say. Your survey alone will not help you to become more unbiased. Look at this. This is the 
classical telltale example of how science can help you to come out of bias. If you ask 7 billion people on Earth, everybody will say it is the sun which raises in the east and sets in the west and it is the one which is moving. So that's what they see. But in reality, everybody also know that it is the Earth which moves around the sun because that's what science has taught them. They have believed it. I don't think they have understood it. I don't think they experience it. Right? But all of us, not only I'm talking about general people, even the scientists, right? So it's some a fundamental concept, like whether Earth moves around the sun or sun moves around the sun, is not based on sensory perception. If you're based on only sensory perception, you would have asked 7 billion people, all 7 billion people would say exactly the same thing. Then you would say, oh, it is Earth which moves, sorry, it's the sun which moves around us, right? That what you need to do in your science policy is to find the ways of removing the biasness when you collect data. If a data is based only on certain surveys and asking more opinion from others, you are tend to get more bias. You cannot remove completely all the bias. You may get, you know, uh, you may go wrong in your interpretation and you may come up with a wrong policy, right? So this is the best example. Why science education is important in the society. This tells you this picture. Okay, next slide, please. And modern education third wave, as Professor Adam Nasima used to mention, when post-independent India, we have a spurt of activities, and so many things were set up, you know, uh, by in the first 20, 30 years of that time. Next slide. And when I say education, I'm also talking about research is also happening all the time, education and research. It's actually, it's, you can call it as one integrated term right now. Uh, it's not so much of dichotomy. I'll come to that in a minute. So we had self-sufficiency in food. Many of these organizations, which was, you know, supported during the post-independent time, although they were come whether pre-independent time or post-independent contributed to this. And uh, IAC has... You know, I, this slide I'm using uh, Professor Abhinandan for the last 15 years. I'm not using it because today I'm not addressing, you know, the science policy scholars sitting in IAC Bangalore. Uh, IAC did lead uh, many, many new government initiatives, whether the DAE, the RISRO, DST, DBT, industry like Bell, which is the, just behind IAC Bangalore. They all are initiatives of, you know, IAC Bangalore. Because the, the solid science was being done and they are the ones who thought of policy for the beer and you know their discovery basic science and IIT is I'm sure all of you know it's sort of a strength behind this new economy is the symbolic of India's modern you know confidence in modern science and technology including our space technology or defense next slide please now <laughs> that's what turned around right our investment in 19 about post-independent, the first 50 years in science and technology, both in research and education. Education provided a huge workforce required for agriculture, IT industry, and you know, and uh, science and technology, but you know, other things. At the same time, research made us to come out with products required for improvised agriculture, improvised technology, improvised this and provide that kind of thing. So a country which has such low literacy rate as you know, in 1947, within just to human generation. Typically, human generation is 35 years. In 70 years, it completely turned around our economy, right? And, and that ability to turn around economy was contributed in the first 50 years of independence. 1991, July 24th, then economic, uh, sorry, finance minister Manmohan Singh made an you know, announcement that Indian economy is going to be liberated. It would not have happened even 10 years earlier than that. India was not ready for liberalized economy in 1880s. 1991 was sort of a turning point. That turning point came because of the confidence that was built over the last previous 50 years, right? Although the crisis led to that announcement, India had a cash crisis, right? Fiscal crisis. But that fiscal crisis sort of led to the announcement, but India was already ready for that announcement. In fact, I was doing my PhD in Cambridge around that time. I remember seeing in 1988 an article in Guardian, it says to call India a sleeping tiger. They have so much potential, they are simply sleeping and they're not opening their economy. They were knocking the door to make investment in India, but India had not opened the 
door for direct for in what you call today FDI. Today we open our arms, organize melas, go to, to abroad and chief ministers and prime minister go to different countries and tell the investors to invest in India, right? But in the 80s, they were ready to invest, but India had not opened its door. That's why it used to fall sleeping tight. I'll come to that uh, in a minute, uh, opening, you know, confidence, uh, how it happened. The next slide, please. But, you know, you also have to be very objective, right? When you talk about policy and not everything that we did, the Green Revolution thought in such a way that everything worked well, or education and research, everything was thought of so well and, and contributed to the growth of Indian economy. But did you do everything right? Actually, no. For example, India neglected school education in the, in, in, in the importance that was given for technical education and particularly higher education like IITs, right? And that sort of led to the deterioration of school education. There are so many you know, philosophical or psychological or social, sociological explanation to why it may have happened. One explanation is <clears throat> Nehru was a staunch Gandhian, right? And the Gandhian values were very prevalent in 1940s. If, I, if, if we survived the partition, if people stopped you know, uh, their violent act because Gandhiji went on fast for 21 days, uh, that means people were still influenced by him and his thoughts, his work, his philosophy. And his. So I think the people like Gandhi, sorry, Nehru, you know, Abdul Kalam Azad was the education minister and uh, of course Rajendra Prasad or sorry, uh, the first home minister, uh, Sardar Vallabhai Patel. So they all think that influence of Gandhi will continue in India. And, and school education is taken care of by the society, not state doesn't have to provide support to the school education. State, with its resources, better to invest in more expensive organizations like universities or IITs or you know, uh, such kind of organization like DAE, Atomic Energy, TFR, CSR and such kind of organizations because that, you know, people, individuals cannot set up a nuclear reactor or set up a supercomputing facility. That's where state has to sponsor. But a school education, people will handle themselves. It is indeed true. If you look at every small district, right, even today, 700 plus district, you will see that there is at least one ashram set up by Gandhian around 19, you know, 1930s to 1960s, that 30 year time period. Particularly when Gandhi started his uh, Seva Gram in, after he quit, uh, Sabarmati Ashram post Dandi March, he said he will not come back to Sabarmati Ashram until India has become independent. So he left Sabarmati Ashram in 1930, right? Dandi March, Salt March. So when he set up his Seva Gram in uh, Nag Tiyar, Nagpur in Varda, he, it was a perfect ashram. People from all caste and religion were staying together. They were doing agriculture. There was also a small school for school child, going children. And that kind of ashram, that model became very popular and it was set up across the country by all Gandhi followers, right? In my family, for example, my great uncle and my great aunt, they also similar, did similar things in small villages, right? But they thought school education hopefully will take taken care of by, by people themselves and we don't need to worry about it. But as you see today, school edu education is so neglected and we are seeing the, the problem of you know, inefficient school education system and making the, you know, 80% of our Indian population not as productive as they could be. We are not taking the full potential because they are not as well educated. Because if the school education is not good, it's very unlikely that they become good in the higher education and be more productive technically or scientifically or in any other rationally to contribute to the societal development. Second thing that happened in the, is because it's, you know, one of the policy was you scale up that the dichotomy of colleges and universities. It has happened three independent times. In fact, it happened interestingly by one of the noble, uh, you know, uh, so-called noble rulers, uh, if they call uh, benevolent, uh, you know, dictators, what they call, right? So Mysore Maharaja in 1920, nine, sorry, 1930s, just the, yeah, 1930. In Mysore, there was 
a Uraja college and later a Mysore university started, right? But the, there was an organic link between Uraja college and Mysore university. Uraja college also used to run postgraduate courses. So there was not so much of problem. Although there was some deterioration of quality in Uraja college because good faculty went to the university and there was a college became a teaching place and university became a research place. But the, the, the benevolent king said, let's have a college in every district. And he wanted to ensure that that college is of good quality. Where you get good quality faculty, they are in Mysore University. So he said, we have eight districts. Those old Mysore had eight districts. So eight of the faculty from Mysore University were asked to each one of them go to different places. You start a college, right? So it reduced the quality faculty in the university. It reduced, introduced only one quality faculty in each college but they couldn't come out with the research in those colleges. It became a teaching. All of those eight colleges became teaching colleges. And that's the beginning of dichotomy of research and education in the country. Now, Green Revolution, it, it was, there are a lot of discussion one can have it. What was the policy, how, what implementation, how much environmental damage was perceived or predicted how much more happened because of indiscriminate use of fertilizers and pesticides so forth. And of course, water usage pattern changed so much because of the irrigation system. And, and then the, you know, unequal distribution of resources, we didn't give insufficient importance to equal distribution. Even today, there is no clear policy on what should be the ideal agriculture market in this country. What we don't realize is India is again in a dichotomy of modern world versus the traditional world. Farmers have both. When they use modern technology to grow products, when they sell the products, they want to go back to their old, you know, where they have more confidence, the informal agriculture market, right? So all of these things has increased the gap between the poor and rich. And, you know, so things have not gone all over, but the, some things have gone well, some things have not gone well. Right? As you can, all of us have experienced in India. Next slide, please. I'll try to finish in about 10 minutes or so. I'm almost at the end, right? Because 2000 is already entered, right? There's hardly another 10 years left. Oh, okay. Uh, India is now fourth largest economy, all these things we are talking about. And, you know, it's all because of all the people who contributed in two, in two generations. Coming to the FDI, I just wanted to mention this. You know, this is where the policy people, you know, you help. If you look at, you know, we talk about policy of, you know, reverse migration, sorry, reverse brain drain, you know, oh, Indian should contribute to Indian economy directly and kind of stuff, right? The best mind are going to abroad and, you know, what are they doing? All our IIT system is going waste and kind of stuff. But, but in 1970s, when you look, I'm using the word sleeping tiger now, 70s and 80s, the most of the Western IT big giants were built by Indians, not necessarily like leadership position like Satya Nadella or, uh, or uh, uh, what's the second name? Who is in the Google? Sundar Pichai, right? They are not the people at that level, but they are sufficiently leadership level, technology, technocrats. They built IBMs and Intels and including Microsoft uh, in 1970s and 80s. So when they saw a few thousand Indians contributing so well to Indian, uh, sorry, the world technology build, you know, based economy, there must be millions of such Indians in India. So that's where they wanted to start these industries in India. When they talk about foreign direct investment, it's not that they wanted to invest in Indian rail system or Indian uh, Bharat heavy electric, uh, you know, limited or something, not BHEL. They wanted to initiate new industry in India. It could be software like Microsoft out, or Google or Yahoo. Now, of course, Google and Yahoo, but those days was Microsoft and uh, Oracle and such kind of organizations. And of course, manufacturing industry, car, you know, other things. That because they realized that there's so much of things India could do. Now, the second one is, I'm sure Professor Mabinandan will remember, I think all of you are else will be so young here. 
the first few rocket we sent used to go and fall in Bay of Bengal, right? Straight. Well, although it was a bent curve, but it was it used to call straight to Bay of Bengal, but not straight up, right? But 80s onwards, our success rate increased. We started putting satellites in the in the sky. And now, as you, as you know, 10 years ago, we launched a rocket, a jumbo rocket, which launched 104 satellites in one launch, right? You can spend hundreds of crores in trying to give publicity that India should be the best destination for investment. But that one rocket is enough to tell the world what we are capable of. And a few hundred or a few thousand uh, technocrats, what they showed to the world in pre-internet era, pre, uh, uh, you know, YouTube era, was directly communicating with people. And they are the ones who are showing that India can is capable because the Indian education system provided them that skills, right? 1963 is the first BTEC computer science started in IIT Kanpur. And that is the second in the world. After Caltech, India was the second in the world to start a full degree course in computer science. And India had only four computers at that time. There was one in TFR Bombay, there was one in Indian Institute of Science Bangalore, there was one in ISI Statistics uh, Institute in Kolkata, and the fourth was an IIT Kanpur. And all other three people use for research because they're all research institutions. IIT Kanpur being an undergraduate education program, they thought not only we do research using this computer, we'll also teach students how to write programs. In 1963, if they had not started BTEC computer science in 1963, I don't think IT revolution would have happened in India, forget about India, in the rest of the world, because much of the IT revolution, although thought came from some of the Western technocrats, the workforce was provided by India. Okay, so, so as you can make out, if the right policy was not there that use research and teaching in a judicious way in a place like IIT, right? You, know, you would not have achieved many things that we achieved today, right? So go to the next slide, please. I think I'll now move really quickly. Yeah, so this is future now. What I mentioned was like a past, present, and everything is like future. Now you have to sort of figure out what is that we can do for 21st century India, although 20 years already passed now, we are in 2021. And uh, so next slide, please. We are a global village, so we cannot think India as one country in isolation. We have to think everything in a global context, irrespective of whether they like or not, irrespective of how much we want to be really Indian and local, uh, local, what is that? Vocal, locally vocal, globally something, right? What uh, vocal Prime Minister keeps saying. Sorry? Is someone say it again. Vocal for local. Yeah. Vocal for vocal. local. Vocal for local, yeah. Whatever it is. I would call it as uh, locally rooted, globally connected, right? We should be locally rooted because we have our own, uh, you know, way of living in this country, but we have to be globally connected, which is in, in uh, unavoidable. Right. Whether you like it or not, we need to be global. Next slide, please. And future is all kinds of problems. You have no, there is prospects as well as problems. Prospects, you all know it's because of globalization. We have whole global world knowledge is pooled. We have more opportunities, more possibilities. At the same time, is also a problem of inequality, problem of zoonosis or pandemic, or more importantly, the, the problem of the climate change, right? It's going to be extremely, you know, uh, making the world future, you know, uh, more unpredictable. Next slide, please. The extreme weather conditions and so forth. The world changing is too fast. Irrespective of how the climate change and other problems, the world is simply changing fast because we are talking to each other much more. The world changes because of the cultural change. Culture is changing much faster than the earlier time, right? In my school timing, you know, if I and I in 15 years from school to my masters, in 15 years I didn't see a single building coming up on the road in which I was walking every day, right? But in, you know now every second year if you go to a same street you wouldn't recognize because it's, uh, the build, road is changed so much because of new construction and all kinds of changes happening. People will change the, you know, from earlier they used to use a uh, one type of bulb, but now then become 
know, fluorescent bulb and, and then all LED bulb and different colors and, you know, everything changes. The world is changing. Culture is changing. The infrastructure is changing. Our way of doing things changing. Which car we use is changing, right? And next slide, please. So your policy in what 1940s and 50s people thought of policy. I don't know what uh, Akhilesh Gupta mentioned. One uh, very famous Nobel laureate, uh, Dr. Hill, a scientist from Britain, was called by Nehru to spend a couple of years in India, come out with a science and technology policy for India. He was in 1950 and 48-50, when there was, you know, how to reform CSR and how to do things. So many things were discussed at that time. So if you want to do such kind of discussion, like STIP 2020, right? Science and Technology Innovation Policy for 2020 for the next 30 years, let's say, up to 2050. What is that we need to do? But we need to understand that we don't have the luxury of making certain predictions and living with those predictions of 1950s, right? Because world was changing so slow, you can actually see that there's enough time for you to make course corrections. So let's say you thought of something in 1947, but 1957, you achieved something, you didn't achieve something. But because the change is so different between in 10 years, course correction also is easier. But today, you make a policy for next 10 years. Five years from now, the world will be so different that you, so all your policy has become use, meaningless. So you have to accommodate that part of it. So you need to make sure that the world is changing so fast, how do you actually cope with that change and plan things for the future, particularly in research and education, which is always for the much longer uh, time in the uh, in, in future, right? You plan for 15 years ahead of time rather than three years ahead of time, right? So this is where the problem comes uh, in policy. Next slide, please. I don't have any solutions. I'm just making you aware of the problems that you are going to face compared to the policy makers of 1950s. Anyway, we still have uh, another fourth wave because India wanted to move from service economy to knowledge economy, to be more education, science and technology dependent policy for future and implementation of ideas which help in coping with the change, particularly climate change and uh, you know, bring sustainability in our development, sustainability in our living and so forth, and reduce the inequality. So these are very different new organizations we have started and new type of you know, both public and private universities and all kinds of new universities, research and education dichotomy we want to break that and bring them back together. More research integrated organizations are coming up. IAC has started undergraduate program, TFR has started, ICERS was specifically started for undergraduate and research integration. IATs are expanding. No many new universities have been set up and now private universities, philanthropy based universities such as Ashoka, they are also becoming more of a research university than simply a teaching place. Next slide, please. So what we can learn from the pandemic? I know I'm going to talk about the pandemic itself. Next slide. So would there be a world you know, something which is so has happened in the in the last two years, and this is the one of a century kind of a pandemic, really is going to change the world so very differently. The next slide, please. So the, the, the future uh, is not going to be very different than to, you know, what we thought in 2019, although there may be a, a some problem of mobility is going to be. So when we say globally connected, we be still globally connected with the help of internet rather than more physical movement because there is still a lot of problem in physical mobility that may increase more inequality in very different ways because there will be movement of material also we have certain restrictions now another five to ten years people will be very cautious to move in that in the way 80s in the 1819 kind of a year time and movement of people and movement of material will be still restricted so we need to change our policy and produce, produce new type of generate, you know, skill gen human resources, deal with the changing situation, right? And we need more diversity in our education, more learn 
diverse learning outcomes in our education system uh, to do this. So that would be one type of policy is, is increasing the diversity of learning outcome because everything we may have to do ourselves. Uh, although we are globally connected in some way, knowledge you can pool, but skills we may have to have our own. Uh, it's very difficult to outsource everything to another population next or another society. Next slide, please. So, as you all know, um, during the middle of this pandemic, we came out with two great policy documents. One is in national education policy, and another is science and technology innovation policy. The next slide, please. So, uh, no, no, the next slide. I think I already spoken about this. You can skip this. So, uh, we need to increase because the post pandemic, there is a great need to expand our education system, make it more scale at the scale as to expand and also diversity we address here. And we can do this only when we invest more. Because if it is a factory mode education that everybody is taught exactly the same thing, it's, the, it's, the, it's not so expensive. You just make several more MOOCs and everybody will learn the same physics, chemistry, math, biology, or so, social science. And everybody will learn exactly the same thing. If it is a teacher is just teaching something wrong, everybody will learn something wrong. Teacher is teaching correct things and everybody will learn the same correct thing. But the interpretation will remain exactly the same. Because how they learn depends on how their ability to interpret, their ability to analyze things, critical thinking, analytical ability will sort of will be very uniform across the population. But if you want to change that one because we need to do that change in the modern world, then we need to diversify education outcome. That means we need to make every education institute look somewhat different. To make every education institute somewhat different. That means every education is taught research and that research brings in the diversity because research is the one which brings diversity. For example, the physics taught in the physics department of IAC Bangalore is somewhat a different perspective than if, for example, ISA Pune or in Ashoka University because the researchers bring that diversity in perspective. A teacher cannot do that. A teacher will read from a textbook. If a textbook, whatever written, everybody will read exactly the same textbook. Everybody will interpret Newton or Einstein or Schrodinger exactly the same way. But a researcher would interpret differently. Yesterday, I was listening to a famous physicist um, talking about Stephen, um, sorry, um, Stephen Weinberg work, who recently died, a great physicist, Nobel laureate. Weinberg physics, he, he, the way he explained was so interesting. And, and everybody started thinking, you know, and imagining things in their own mind. Weinberg's interpretation of uh, standard model and so forth. So that is very important and that's very expensive education and india can afford now we have that right economy that our policy should be towards that so how to and it's not simply putting more money it has to be effective do, do we have the capability to spend the money even if you have the money right all that thing which now should be your policy document those who are interested in this kind of a policy next slide please second is how to bring in academic excellence and in numbers also academic excellence in in simply in some metrics will not help it has to have a scale right so unless you have large number of good people in the same organization the peer interaction will not happen and and excellence will not emerge out of it next slide please yeah i'll just i already said this we need more you know this is uh, an example given by uh, professor Sen Gupta, who is a former professor of IIC Bangalore Electrical Engineering, who is currently a, a, a honorary faculty at NIAS, National Institute of Advanced Studies in Bangalore. He said, Everest is Everest because of Himalayan range. You can't have Everest because if you consider Everest as a peak and that's your ultimate goal, you can't reach Everest unless there is a Himalayan range. Because Himalayan range is the, the height, the average height is so high. Having a peak like Everest is possible, right? Can you have an Everest at the mean sea level, right? So the, the similarly in, in excellence, unless you have a large number of high quality scientists working in an organization, you can't expect a Nobel laureate to emerge out of the blue. Right? 
you can't expect a fantastic technocrat making all kinds of sustainable product for the society to come out from out of in a, in a desert, right? You have to have that rich, you know, group of excellent people working together. Next slide, please. So our education uh, system should aim for that kind of a system, you know, uh, creation of that kind of a group, right? I think I'll skip all of these things in the interest of the time. So one major problem we are facing in the society is the is the separation of education system into different islands. Unlike in US, for example, you know, the university people don't talk to people in the school. School people don't talk to people in the university, right? Only thing is after the school students come to the university, but until they come to the university, there is no contact between the teachers with the schools and the university and students will not gain from their teachers what the university would be like, how to go for higher education, what is the aim of an higher education, what are the new things happening in higher education and research on the knowledge base, because of there's no contact, right? That we need to sort of, as you say, teachers have to go up in the ladder and come down and students sort of keep going up, right? So unless there is a seamless integration, right? And it should be non-hierarchical. Right? It's not that our school education is something lower or higher education is something higher. Right? It's simply a, a scale which makes them in putting in the pyramid. Right? You have a large school base, slightly smaller college or education university base, and then a fewer research base and so forth. Next slide, please. How to make a policy for this interaction is an interesting, you know, all of you can think of how to improve interaction between schools and colleges, how to schools and universities, schools and research institutes like ISC Bank. Yeah, so another is we are launching NEP, rolling out NEP 2020. We already have lakhs of cheap teachers and tens of millions of students in the system. How do you change the education system laterally, right? Because unless you provide so much support to the teachers, how will they sort of align themselves to the aims and missions of NEP 2020? How do they teach students 21st century skills? They themselves do not have those skills, right? Who will give that? I mean, we are, we are making slogans that all of our students should have 21st century skills. First of all, we don't know what 21st century skills means, right? So, but, but the first teacher should be skilled, right? How do you provide lakhs of teachers who are taught in, 19, in 20 years ago the skills, new skills, including AI and ML. For example, Prime Minister made a statement that every student before they leave the school should be AI and ML uh, educated or skilled. But how many teachers know what is AI and ML? How do they, how many of them know what's the long form of AI and ML, right? So I think it, we need to come out with a policy how to empower teachers to teach better, prepare the student for their future, not for our future. Our future is done, gone. The student's future is what is left, the future. Next slide, please. International collaboration in the modern world is important. Pandemic has taught us the importance of you know, collaboration. Others would not have developed vaccine and drugs in such shortest time possible and all produce and start vaccinating you know, hundreds of millions of people. That collaboration is extremely important. People should realize that we have to work as one global village, you know, irrespective of uh, any differences in amongst us. Next slide, please. I think I'll uh, skip all of these things in interest of, I'll stop here. Just see, yeah, there was the last time. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I took much longer than I thought. You can have some questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh... Professor Sasi for uh, this lecture and uh, covering all these aspects, uh, the things from um, biological perspective, things from historical perspective, and all the different landmarks that, uh, you know, in terms of policy and evolution of uh, uh, higher education institutions in India and through different waves, and uh, uh, also the recent initiatives and in, in what direction things are going. So it's a very, very comprehensive uh, lecture in that regard. I now open the floor for uh, discussion and questions. So if anyone has any questions and any other points to raise or any other 
any other points that would like to be discussed please uh, raise your hands or directly just turn on your camera and mic and uh, yeah please speak um, maybe just to start things with i'll start with uh, or okay sagun has a question yes sagun please go ahead uh, uh, no uh, surish started just go on I'll, i'll come after you yeah thanks professor shiva this uh, is wonderful lecture yes okay. uh, thanks sagun so uh, my question is a uh, a uh, very simple uh, so given this experience that you have and um, about all the evolution of uh, recent higher education institutes as well as research in india and last uh, since independence at least what do you think are the like things that have to be in a successful recipe for a policy to work in terms of uh, producing increasing the outcome research outcome and other outcomes of this institute in these institutes at the institutional level as well as uh, increasing this uh, broader understanding of science in the population and uh, you know becoming scientifically and technologically advanced while taking care of all the human and uh, ecological so, value you know the, the modern technology also helps us to collect a uh, large amount of data and also an unbiased way to collect the evidence to frame the policy so that part is taken care of right but you know we have to still very careful and you collect data because data can also have mixed with noise particularly if you are collecting data from social media or from google right so we have to be careful that your data is really really reliable once you have established the reliability of the data then you can analyze and come out with a nice policy so actually framing a good policy these days is easier implementation is the problem the two reasons one is the 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 quality people for implementation are not that many right and this and also the 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 you know the population sizes you know increase so much uh, availability of resources for implementation of any policy is also a problem because the scale is much larger now okay so in that context what we need to keep in mind in policy well framing and developing an implementation strategies who is going to implement your policy who are the, what are the roadblocks in in um, you know to effective implementation and trying to work around it right and at the same time also develop a policy for better implementation so who are the implementer for example in agriculture most policy implementers are block development officers right or agriculture officers of the department every taluka level there appears how do you train them to implement the right policy right that should be integrated in the policy implementation scheme otherwise you know it will become ineffective the second is how you communicate sorry how do you communicate at least again the modern technology will help you to communicate the implementation strategy better rather than simply writing an oem what is called office memorandum saying that everybody should do this from next year onwards in every taluka or every district if the government issues a, a circular it's not effective but you have also explain the rationale behind it what are the pitfalls what are the unexpected you know some roadblocks you may face how to overcome these roadblocks all these can be explained in the language in the raising right illustration using video using you know using the, what's called uh, case studies demonstrations so you also have a technology on your hand to communicate not only policy also implementation strategy in fact nep the main problem is how to implement that's where the technology helps so you can actually train every teacher in their own language at their level it's different levels of schools right using the right technology right? so yeah these are the kind of things we need to adopt in our modern policy research uh, thanks a lot uh, professor sasi now we have a bunch of question uh, there are some hand raised as well as there are some questions put in the chat box maybe uh, we'll start with chagun's question yes chagun over to you yeah uh, thanks suresh uh, thank you professor sashi i mean uh, a very interesting lecture in fact the flow of uh, presentation was also very interesting uh, to lead to something something was said then something was understood also reading between the lines uh, i'm i'm quite in, uh, interested by the fact you presented the himalaya analogy 
uh, with the Himalayan range and Everest. Okay, that is a like, sorry. Uh, I mean, the spray and pray model, which I think many of our funding agencies are following, and at the same time, there is also emphasis to uh, nurture the Everests uh, or how to spot the Everest or future to be Everests. Uh, the dilemma is always about um, access, giving more people access to good scientific infrastructure, good learning resources versus uh, going to the uh, ivory towers and then giving them. So ivory towers on one hand and then providing access to larger populations on the other hand. I think NEP touches upon the uh, um, the, the state university research system. So how from a governance angle you see this dilemma is managed because it's like sitting uh, like on the fence trying to look at both sides and trying to take decisions. How do you how do you see this from the governance point of view? Yeah, yeah. so uh, I mean it's, it's a big challenge. You know, I don't think there is any one. I mean, I, I'm not an expert in this area to think of a solution, but my only confidence is if we're sincere enough to do things, Again, technology helps, right? So what is required to, you know, nurse, identify and nurture talent or excellence is our way of identifying. You should use the right metrics. You should use the right methods. And again, technology, I think, is coming handy there, where you, irrespective of what is the skills of a student, if you know their raw potential, if there is a way to identify, right? And how do they think? How do they react to an unexpected situation? And how do they solve a problem? Irrespective of what problem, you know, you don't give any mathematical problem to a, someone who has not even done simple numerical analysis, right? So you give them a problem of their, you know, background in their context and see how do they think and solve the problem? And how do you improvise their thinking by providing certain ways of, you know, bringing rationality into their way of thinking and how they further improvise it. I think, you know, the more and more is, of course, we need teachers. We cannot alienate teachers, but teachers should be aided with the help of technology to do this. And my feeling is uh, one or two years of handholding a little bit of, you know, a, you know, um, in helping them to learn on their own, then the students pick up on their own. Self-learning ability is what makes finally everybody a good scientist, good researcher. Right, or good social science or uh, natural science researcher. That ability to learn on their own is what we need to teach. All of us, you know, those who have done PhD, you learn many things on your own. In fact, many of all my PhD students learn, you know, techniques and the knowledge which is I never learned. In fact, even today I don't do many experiments, which is my experimental skills are all 30 year old. But my students learn many new things on their own. <laughs> So I think their ability to learn on their own is what we need to. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, Sashi, I think that is also from Radhika. Yeah. There's a question, Gautam. Yeah, Radhika Gautam has a question. And also there are some couple of questions in the chat box. Maybe I'll just read one question from the chat and then we can go to Radhika and Gautam if that's okay. Okay. Yeah. So here uh, Anurag uh, is asking. So he is a, is, he's very new to the whole policy research space. He wants to understand the importance of evidence uh, in policy making. So he, he's asking if you could, uh, with some example, can be can explain how evidence uh, policy can be crafted from evidence. To him, it seems that evidence can evaluate the impact of policy, but policy making is an inherently ideological, political economy process. And he so, says the one thing is, you know, just to give you the best example, you know, I, mean, you know, I thought it's it's almost commonsensical that it's very obvious that evidence is so important for policy. One is evidence will help you to understand the problem that what is the scale of the problem and what is the root cause of the problem. Right. Second is for the people who will want to implement the policy that is framed. We'll also understand that there is a problem and that problem is there is an evidence for this, like climate change, for example. Now, climate change, if you don't have an evidence that what caused the climate change, right? And because it is something which is beyond our comprehension, how can you say Earth is so large and Earth temperature, you know, average temperature is reduced by half a degree centigrade, can create such big calamities, 
if you don't have the right evidence to prove this, that the fuel, uh, the fossil fuel burning has caused this increase in temperature, that increased temperature, even a half a degree can melt Antarctic ice to polar ice to, you know, extreme weather conditions, cyclones and hurricanes to, uh, you know, our drought by means. If you don't provide that evidence, neither you can come out with the right policy what to do with the problem because you don't even understand the problem itself. Second is the people who want to implement, like, you know, common people also, whether it is a administrators or common people, they won't consider it as a serious problem. They think that it is, we are unnecessarily, you know, giving all the blame on the fossil fuel burning and how can half a degree change can cause so much of havoc, right? Or one degree in change in the global. That too, you know, what Trump did, right? When there was a, you know, snowstorm in uh, New York, he, he was basically, you know, mocking all the climate scientists saying that you people talking about global warming and here is a cold wave, right? And here also global average temperature of the earth is increased from 15 degree to 16 degree. And we are all and happily living with 30, 35 degrees centigrade in India. For us, global warming has no meaning in a way, unless you provide the right evidence. So that's the best example. Okay, next. Uh, thanks a lot for highlighting this. Uh, yeah, so next uh, I'll take, uh, we can take a question from uh, Pradhika, then go to a comment from uh, Nimita in the chat box and then Gautam. So over to you, Pradhika. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks. Yeah. Radhika, yes, go ahead. Can't hear you. Thanks, Professor Shashi, wonderful talk. It has pointers right. in the historical perspective. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you. yes, you are. Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Your voice is breaking okay. sometimes. All right. Uh, so audio. I just say. Maybe you can type your questions on the chat box. Okay. All right. And meanwhile, Gautam can ask his question. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. Yes, Gautam. Yes, Gautam. Yeah. Thank you, professors. Uh, sir, uh, my question is also related to what Anurag has asked, just an extension of that, that when you as an academician or when policy makers use this term evidence based, I mean, uh, for me, it sounds a bit like exclusivist that it uh, it's kind of sidelines other alternative knowledge systems that only a particular method, something that we use, if you can provide evidence using that, only then we can accept your knowledge or we can accept your evidence. So it's, I mean, it's kind of used in a way that alternative knowledge systems are proto science or pseudo sciences. So how can science policy in this in the modern way, be inclusive towards these alternative uh, some, uh, knowledge systems, no, which no. are so not so like, yeah. positive based. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, in fact, evidence uh, is sort of uh, sort of connects all knowledge systems. There's nothing like even uh, you know astrologists they want evidence, right? But they, you know, I'm an I'm not a believer of astrology, right? I know it's I call it as not science. I call it as a belief system. Right. There are so many belief system in medical system also. Right. But even the beliefs believers also want an evidence. Right. For example, believer of a God. I'm an atheist, but believer of God also want an evidence. For example, miracles is an evidence of existence of God. Why do they propose propo, uh, propagate stories of miracles in, in religion? Because that is an evidence of existence of God. So evidence is part of every knowledge system. It's nothing like science versus non-science. What science does is helps you to make sure that the way you collect the evidence is as unbiased as possible. In a way, it is more inclusive. Unbiased means what? For example, I want to improve the agriculture market system. Agriculture market system is operated by three, four different major religion groups, multiple different caste system, multiple different class systems, multiple different kind of products grown in different geoclimatic conditions, catering to different taste of people. Now, how do you ensure such a complex network? Uh, so, so many different diverse factors are involved. How do you ensure a profitable market system for every farm? 
whether it's a one acre small farm holder or a hundred acre large farm, right? A rich farm, right? So when you collect evidence, you want to be as unbiased so that, you know, you respect if, you know, if the person is one acre or a hundred acres, both should get equivalent amount of returns. Whether that person he grows, you know, animal product or a plant product, both should get equitable returns. This is what helps you to come out with a policy if you have a way of collecting unbiased evidence. Evidence per se is nothing very science about it. Evidence is our human mind wants evidence for everything. Without evidence, we don't want to believe. Even if you want to believe in ghosts, you want an evidence to say that there's a ghost. At least there should be a white cloth hanging and see at midnight on a tamarind tree. That's enough for us to believe a ghost. But you need that evidence. Right, sir. I mean, that is also being empiricist. Now we, uh, well, that's what human mind is. I mean, finally, we you are dealing with human people. You are not developing a you know a policy for 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 a for a sun or a for a Pluto or Neptune, right? You are dealing with people and and dealing with even the biodiversity. We are talking about how to protect biodiversity from humans. It's not about protecting biodiversity or enriching biodiversity. You are not dealing with two flowers or flower and honeybee interaction. You are dealing with how humans don't interfere between the flower and the honeybee interaction, so that flower and honeybee continue to propagate. I mean, these arguments can go on forever, but okay. Yeah, I'm very happy to, you know, on sidelines, maybe a Sunday or a glass of beer, we can have a Zoom meeting. Sure, sir, sure. Would love to have it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Gautam, and thanks, Professor C. Yeah, I think uh, all the fellows would really love to continue engagement with uh, you in different forms. Uh, but quickly jumping to the next question, it's uh, on chat by Nimita, and then I'll take question from, uh, I'll go to question from Radhika, and then end with maybe Professor Abhinandan. So uh, Radhi, uh, Nimita's question is, uh, is on research excellence. Uh, so she is coming from STS uh, study and the feminist uh, theories on this area, and she is uh, asking that the research excellence, uh, the whole issue of research excellence, has been discussed and debated across disciplines uh, and context and scales. So, according to you, how shall policy research address this challenge in order to sustain excellence? No, no. So, uh, who, who asked this question? Nim Dr. Nimita Pandey. Oh, Nimita, I know. I'm happy to talk to you again some other time. So I'm not an exclusivist in terms of believer of excellence. There is a, that's basically a pseudo, uh, this one, because what is the excellence? How do you define it? And where do you set a standard? Is Venki Ramakrishnan is the, is the standard of excellence in biology research or chemistry research or Raman in physics research? Because excellence is not in isolation of your society. Excellation, excellence is part of the societal land of it, right? So we had to we had to accommodate that part. That's why you know uh, when you mentioned this uh, that you come from a, this uh, feminist uh, philosophy. I think I think it's very important to be grounded in your context when you define an excellence. Right? There is no excellence has should not have an absolute bar. Right? That's why these metrics that is used for excellence, uh, whether it is impact factor of a journal or in citation of a paper is not the right way of measuring the excellence. And I only I know what is not what should not be done, but what is the solution? We can discuss some other time. But I also don't have a right answer for that. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Sasi. Uh, Radhika. Next. The next question is from Radhika. Yes. Uh, so she is uh, asking about the uh, lot of work that is done at the university uh, is often not taken up by the industry and uh, it doesn't scale up. So she would like to know like uh, your inputs on how universities can reach out to industries to attract endowment from industry side as it happens in many foreign universities, for example, and how we can uh, achieve such endowment from industry and government can push it in this direction. What should be government policy steps, for example? In so um, I'm sure one of you must be interacting uh, with uh, TSA's office on this aspect. So uh, corporate social responsibility is something which is making mandatory for all companies, industries to contribute to R&D, to endowment, you know, some donations and, and such kind of philanthropic contribution. 
and the people also particularly the organizations which are built up post independent because of education and research and wealth is created because of knowledge they all have realized like infosys you know almost all it companies spend more money on philanthropy than family run you know ambani's or uh, birlas uh, they do charity charity is different than philanthropy so improving the knowledge base and 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 making the productivity more sustainable and more perpetual is what philanthropy wants to aim and that is sort of in, entering india more recent entered india more recently and it is spreading now and the pandemic has also time is the time when more people actually contribute to r&d not simply charity in terms of buying oxygen cylinders or something which is also of course important it was needed as there was a crisis people did contribute but beyond that they are also contributing to research and that culture we expect that it will continue and government is also making changes in the policy of you know what constitute tax exemption what constitute tax doesn't constitute tax exemption which is considered as csr which is not so they are making more uh, you know more sort of channelizing the philanthropy more towards research in the university system uh, hopefully it will bring in more change thanks uh, professor sir now uh, we can take last question from professor abi and then we can end this session yes over to you uh, so see uh, many people have commented on uh, some aspect of uh, our the indian university system uh, going back to the 1950s and their view is that the creation of csir uh, labs as well as uh, the da labs sort of starved our universities of funding and they also uh, these uh, um, policies also uh, sort of divorced universities uh, uh, to major functions which is undergraduate education and, and research um, right so uh, education went to the universities and then the research went to all these newly created uh, institutions which were also privileged with funding and autonomy and so on um, do you think that there has been a major change since then uh, with regard to our universities of course we have created iits and icers and so on i'm still talking about uh, our universities and do no, you no, the, foresee a time when yeah. the gap between yeah. our elite institutions like iits and icers on the one hand and universities will that gap no, ever that definitely yeah i do see i'll tell you what has happened uh the policy the mistake was policy was the, the, the purpose was okay was commendable the mistake was to you know expand the research too fast at the cost of education so the best of the university went to csr institutes and later dat dbt da institutions when they do research and they didn't do any teaching you remember i told you about this uh, story of mysore university uh, sorry mysore maharaja creating 28 different new colleges Right. one in shimoga one in chitadurga one in uh, daungere and so forth and the among the eight instead if you had said eight you would have started let's say two you know four people on one side four people on that side they would have continued to you know groom excellence among the faculty by, you know attract some good students train them those students will become teachers and they start new colleges and so forth they kept some two three generation time build more colleges instead everything was done in the same year because in the hurry to bring in democratizing the knowledge what you call it now india is in a hurry to build the nation provide technological solution to the real life problem i think we went in too far at the cost of the education system at the at the cost of the education system and that has become to some extent irreparable damage now with all this as you said to solve the problem instead of repairing the university system we created the icer and because we decided that university problem is irreparable let's start something new but you cannot avoid having these universities because 90% of the students still go to the you know, conventional university system only 5 to 10% of the students go to iits and icers and uh, i'm only talking about undergraduate and research integration so that way uh, you know the only now is hopefully that new nep 2020 more liberal arts more credit sharing and more uh, project oriented self learning 
oriented learning <clears throat> may bring in back something which is lost in the university uh, but i don't know the scale at which the problem is how to solve is a uh, very very difficult okay. but one thing is um, not because i am in ashoka now uh, the the number of new private universities are coming and they are all aiming for research and that also brings in some positive change because finally if the economy drives this right and the, with the, the people you know aspiring for good education also see the importance of research integrated education more and more convention university also will start looking at that because that's what the people want right so many times in indian bureaucracy that you know all of us think that whatever we do is you know for us we don't care for what is the impact of what we do outside the society but all of us whether i'm an ias officer or a professor in university we are contributing to society in our own way and but that has to change that thinking hopefully it will happen thank you yeah. thanks thanks professor ravi thanks sasi so yeah we can uh, very uh, yeah very quickly thank you very much uh, uh, sasi for taking out this time and uh, so comprehensively covering the whole scope and evolution of uh, science technology research as well as uh, higher education in india in last uh, hundred and thousands of years and uh, yeah putting light on different aspects of it and uh, sharing your diff through different stories like sharing what has happened and how things have evolved to the state where we are now and i i believe it's extremely important to all the fellows here to keep this perspective in mind as uh, they embark on this especially the new fellows they embark on this journey towards uh, contributing to the policy uh, research work at dst and policy work at uh, in uh, synergy with other ministries and departments as well so thank you very much uh, at, at the end uh, i would uh, like you to request you to make some uh, remarks uh, for uh, the fellows like as they are starting this journey especially the new fellows what would you like to convey to them and uh, how they should uh, uh, see things and what should be their vision towards uh, in this direction I know I'm, no, I'm, I, I don't think I should. I should. Uh, I'm not a. I cannot preach. So uh, I think uh, what I was trying to say in the beginning itself that having an historical perspective of the problem. I mean, I give a historical perspective on a bigger problem: the nation, research, education, poverty aspect. But even a small problem, getting an historical perspective helps because that's the only way to understand. Because we all build our knowledge based on the previous. our knowledge and we add on to that one right that's how the knowledge is growing for the last 5 to 6000 years it's always incremental sometimes there are milestones and you know uh, landmark changes like einstein or uh, newton so but but even in the policy it's important that what happened before what was the decision what went wrong what went okay what was the excellent decision what were the implementation hurdles but without looking at the implementation framing of policy is is what i think it's not correct that's the only thing you i want you to remember that who is going to implement your policy and when what are the road blocks in implementation if you don't understand that it becomes a paper piece of paper you'll never be able to see the light of the day indeed uh thank you thank you very much again for this uh, message uh and uh, i i i think i join uh, i also speak for all the fellows here that this has been a great learning experience for me at a personal level it's also a very nostalgic experience to hear you <laughs> so thank you very much and uh, we look forward to have your uh, guidance and support in this journey and uh, we'll be engaging with you further i hope uh, on the various activities of the center as well as of the fellowship program so with this uh, we can end this uh, session and i know you are, you have another another meeting now so at the end of the session now and look forward to uh, work with you uh, in fact the next yeah. meeting i have is is actually on policy on on water <laughs> use water management policy for pune region there is some meeting i have to attend awesome as okay. part of the pune knowledge cluster chagun is familiar with the knowledge cluster i think professor abhinandan also there's one in bangalore also now 
and uh, I'm part of the Pune Knowledge Cluster and Delhi Knowledge Cluster. So okay. right now there's a meeting of Pune Knowledge Cluster on water management. Okay. Thanks, Sashi. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Abhinanda. Thank you very much, uh, Suresh. You conducted so well. Thank you. I'm happy to thanks come back Sashi. again if there is a mutual sure. convenient time available. Sure. I'm so glad to see Anjali is on call. Well, I think she's also reaching out to us to engage more. We'll be happy to, yeah. Okay. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye, bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye.